Are your elbows or forearms tightening up, aching and burning, or just plain killing you from riding your bike? Hi, I'm Alan Ouellette, and this is the Tennis Supple Classroom Podcast. Whether you're a road cyclist, mountain biker, or motocross rider, we're going to cover how biking can cause elbow and forearm pain and injuries like tennis and golfer's elbow. We're going to talk about the perils and the pitfalls in dealing with these injuries as in the wrong way to treat them, the way almost everyone does, and what I believe you'll begin to see is a better, more sensible approach. So whether you're just trying to notice the telltale stiffness, tension, aching, and soreness in your inner or outer elbows or forearms, or you've been suffering from significant persistent burning pain for months, perhaps already with a diagnosis of tennis or golfer's elbow in hand, let's start by talking about the difference between these two conditions. Because it doesn't matter whether you've ever picked up a racket or club. If you feel pain at your outer elbow and or outer forearm, and the injury is to the tendons connecting there, it's called tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis or something similar to that. If the pain and injury is to the tendons connecting to your inner elbow, it's called golfer's elbow or medial epicondylitis. But as a rider or cyclist, you know, feel free to just call it biker's elbow if you want. You may already be well aware that golfer's and tennis elbow can be very annoying, disruptive injuries can be extremely difficult to recover from. If you don't already know this because it's a new injury to you, let me be the first to warn you to watch the road ahead because there are many potholes to avoid with this. How did it begin for you? At first, maybe only hurt after a long ride, perhaps tightening up a little and aching that night or getting stiff and sore the next day? Or did it flare up like a beast only to calm back down after a day or two? Of course, it may have already gotten to the point where it's a total monster the minute you even think about grabbing your bars. In any case, I can tell you right off the bat that a lot of the problems and struggles that sufferers face trying to heal and recover from this beast have to do with myths and misunderstandings about the nature of the injury, which can lead to treatment mistakes that prolong the pain and keep you from riding or from fully enjoying your rides. So let me help you try and avoid that to help you break out of the vicious cycle, escape what I call the triple trap because it can heal and you can recover with the right perspective and a better treatment approach. Starting with understanding the injury itself. The injury, or better yet, the injury dynamic is the gradual insidious process that ends up hurting the tendons at either your inner or outer elbow, which is the most serious challenging aspect of the injury. And the first thing you need to know and keep in mind, this is a gradual chronic injury, not an acute trauma injury that happens suddenly. In the beginning, what you have is a pattern of muscle tension that builds up over months or even years. And yes, there are numerous bike fitting and ergonomic positioning issues that can cause you to accumulate excessive tension faster when you're out of alignment with your bike. These can be significant factors, and if you correct them early on, that might be enough to break the cycle and get you out of trouble. But I'm going to leave most of that to the bike fitting experts. I do include references to that in the article that goes with this episode if you want to explore this aspect. Look for the link in the description if you're not already here at tennisableclassroom.com. Instead, let's talk about the broader issues that impact all cyclists, including mountain bikers, road riders, motocross bikers, and sometimes even stationary cyclists. The things that get to you, even when you're aligned perfectly with your bike, seat, and handlebars, namely tension and vibration. You have to frequently squeeze to brake And yet, you have to constantly grip your bars to steer and control your bike. Harder on mountain and motocross bikes, of course, which builds up tension in the muscles of your wrist and fingers, most of which are in your forearms. And there's a certain level of vibration that your muscles, tendons, ligaments, and joints have to constantly absorb. Again, more if you're a mountain biker or motocross rider. None at all if you're on a stationary bike, naturally. How these patterns of tension end up causing injury and pain is a simple matter in some ways and more complex in others. Simple in that your overworked and exhausted muscles become tense, weak muscles. Those tense, weak muscles will start feeling achy, sore, and painful in protest in the early stages. Gradually, sticky restrictions called adhesions start to form in your muscles, which is essentially the collagen protein in your muscles binding to itself due to a combination of tension, compression, friction, and and changes on the biochemical level. As this dynamic progresses, your muscles become chronically tighter, weaker, and more restricted. And that eventually begins to overload 
the tendons of those muscles. And you start getting that telltale burning pain at your inner or outer elbow where these tendons have their attachments. They attach to the little bony knobs called epicondyles at your inner and outer elbows. And it can sometimes feel like the very bones themselves are on fire. And by the way, sometimes this manifests in the tendons at your wrist rather than at your elbows, or occasionally both. The worst part is, if the stress on your tendons continues long enough, they eventually begin to break down. Now, the question of why the tendon breaks down instead of healing and getting stronger in response to the increased load is still not fully understood. We have to assume it's partly because the load and stress is increasing faster than the body can adapt to it. This is where things get a bit more complicated. The key to grasping what we do know about these injuries, however, is that the process is mostly a degenerative one, and its nature is to creep up on you gradually. Some riders may ride for years without pain, only to eventually start to feel these symptoms, perhaps triggered by some grueling event, a marathon ride that pushes them over the threshold, or perhaps just by the accumulation of the injury dynamic over all those years, which eventually tips the balance. Either way, it's an injury process that can start, stall, progress in healing, and then backslide and get worse again. Again, not all at once in an acute, sudden injury, like a sprain or other type of tear, Although eventually, tears can sometimes happen to tendons that have been significantly weakened by the degenerative process if it progresses unchecked long enough, which usually takes years to get that severe. The best news I can give you is that it can, you can be in terrible pain and the, the injury can still be in its early stages. Unfortunately, I have to tell you the reverse is sometimes true. Your tendons can be degenerating on you without many symptoms and by the time you're really feeling it, it's progressed quite a bit already. It's just more likely to be the other way around. Your body naturally wants to alert you to anything that's going wrong before it becomes critical. So try not to worry if your pain is fairly recent. Even if it's pretty severe, you may not have, have any significant degeneration yet, especially if it's only been a few months, and especially if you're a new rider. You don't usually get degenerative changes after just a few weeks, and probably not even after only two to three months of doing something. More like six months to a year although this is still a very difficult thing to predict. Eventually, however, that's the fate that awaits people with most chronic tendon injuries if they don't take the right steps to heal and recover. So again, the most important thing to understand is that these tendon injuries are usually of this degenerative nature, technically known as tendinosis, especially the longer they persist. And these injuries are not of an acute inflammatory nature, even though they're still often referred to as tendinitis. Let me say that again. The vast majority of tennis and golfer's elbow cases are not inflammatory, especially not in the long run once they become chronic. Maybe a little bit in the beginning as your body's trying to heal your tendons, but this early attempt often fails. And, and in this time frame is the key period when tendon injury sufferers of all kinds are often led astray down the wrong road. The myth that these injuries are a form of inf inflammatory tendonitis is extremely persistent in both medical circles and in layman's lore. Although all you need to do is look in the right place and it becomes very clear what the medical research actually shows, never mind the confusing mixed messages that sites like WebMD may give you. So let's get into the right and wrong ways to treat these frustrating, disruptive injuries once they become chronic. If your problem is relatively new and you've never had a tendon injury like this before, you may be unfamiliar with the standard medical approach. But if you've been down this road a while, you're probably already familiar with these so-called treatments, starting with anti-inflammatory pills, which come in both over-the-counter and prescription varieties. And you're told the goal is to reduce inflammation, although they relieve pain and other symptoms, whether those symptoms have anything to do with inflammation or not, by the way. Unfortunately, these drugs, even the seemingly harmless over-the-counter varieties like ibuprofen, can be damaging to your digestive system when taken for weeks or months on end. But the key thing is that inflammation is not the problem in the first place. Next, there are lotions, liniments, and other topical remedies that are applied right on the local area rather than being taken internally. Some are anti-inflammatory, some are analgesic, and some just help increase blood flow to the area, which may actually be helpful. But at least the anti-inflammatory medical gels are much more targeted and less toxic than the pill forms of these drugs. In the end, you may feel a little better temporarily, but this isn't going to help your tendons heal. And then there's ice and cold packs, of course. 
Now, ice can be an effective form of short-term pain relief, but you'll probably be told to do it you know, 10, 15 minutes, several times a day, supposedly to reduce inflammation, which again is not the problem. Cortisone shots are the big guns that you really need to be wary of, though. These shots are a very powerful way of suppressing symptoms locally in and around the injured tendon. And like the anti-inflammatory pills and creams, they suppress pain and other symptoms, whether those symptoms are actually caused by inflammation or not. The problem is cortisone has long been proven to be damaging to tendons. So if what you want most is long-term healing, think long and hard about these terrible shots. Okay, what about braces and other supports? These intuitively seem like a good idea. Protect the injury by limiting motion, right? The problem is that aside from sprains and fractures, which tennis and golfer's elbow are not, mild to moderately injured tendons do not heal better when immobilized. Only if you have like an extreme tear or something like that. They need movement to heal properly. So what do all these treatments have in common? Apart from braces, most of the standard medical and common wisdom treatments are misdirected at chasing and trying to suppress inflammation. And the short answer to why this is utter madness is because inflammation is an essential part of your healing process. Let me ask you this. How could a stage of your own healing process itself be a cause of your injury or even a part of your problem? Ponder that for just a moment. You can't heal a soft tissue injury, which includes muscles, tendons, and ligaments, without going through an inflammatory process. This is one of the most commonly learned and promptly forgotten facts learned in medical and nursing schools. The other reason inflammation fighting is total nonsense is that the vast majority of cases of golfer's tennis elbow are not inflammatory conditions in the first place. They're degenerative, as we already established. Degeneration is unfortunately the opposite of healing. It's breakdown, it's decay, or call it rot. Healing is regeneration, it's repair, and it requires inflammation along with good circulation. And increased circulation, what do you know? That's one of the functions of inflammation. Okay, so what's the right way to treat these tendon injuries? Well, you can probably already guess we have to start off by making our peace with inflammation to allow it, to let it be. We even want to go as far as to warm the area regularly to stimulate circulation and the healing that comes with good blood flow, hopefully refraining from freezing our muscles and tendons with ice, which inhibits circulation. We allow inflammation to do what it needs to do, which is initiate the healing process. Then we need to get proactive and start mobilizing our muscles and tendons with hands-on techniques and gentle stretches to release and free our muscles from the chronic tension and those restrictive adhesions instead of immobilizing them with a the brace, which can sometimes create more adhesions. And most importantly, to do this mobilizing and releasing with advanced massage techniques. I have several that I use in my practice and I teach my members here at Tennis Elbow Classroom. If you're motivated, you can learn these techniques and use them to help yourself. For an overview, look up my article and video on the three best self-massage techniques for tennis elbow. If you need to Google that, just do a search for tennis elbow classroom, best self-massage techniques. I've been specializing in treating tennis and golfer's elbow for well over a decade, 15 years, something like that, with excellent results. And I'm convinced that this is the most important key intervention most people need to help reverse and recover from these injuries. Now, I should point out, you do need certain rehab exercises too, of course. But from my perspective, it works best to delay those rehab exercises, to wait until a certain threshold is reached. Yes, the exercises are essential at the right time. But the problem in my experience is that they're often begun way too early in the rehab process. My approach here at Tennis Elbow Classroom is to suggest that you postpone rehab exercise until you first make some progress with your self-massage and stretching techniques, and your worst symptoms have significantly subsided. Consider waiting until your pain is down by at least 75%. This seems to result in a much higher rate of success that helps people avoid having so many flare-ups and setbacks caused by trying to strengthen the injured, painful muscles and tendons too soon. If you'd like to learn more about these treatment and exercise strategies, please come on over to TennisElbowClassroom.com if you're not already here. I have dozens of free articles, videos, and podcast episodes, as well as a free introductory video course called Tennis Elbow 101. If you're watching the YouTube version of this, just look for links in the description below the video. 
If you're watching the Vimeo version and you'd like to learn more about either my tennis or Golfer's Elbow program, you'll see links to both self-help programs at the very end of this video. And if you're listening on a podcast app like Apple Podcasts, there should be a link to me, but if you don't see one, just Google Tennis Elbow Classroom. One last thing, whether you're on YouTube, Stitcher, or some other platform, please subscribe and leave me a rating if you can. Thank you so much. This is Alan Willette from Tennis Elbow Classroom, wishing you many, many miles riding strong and pain-free. Let's break your vicious cycle.